Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to attempt to cover the entire chapter this evening as we're going through this entire book verse by verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, since there are 21 verses here, we're going to begin by simply reading a few verses to get us started, and then we'll preach on the whole thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not man, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time. Man, those are three key words. Before the time. Judge nothing. People get in trouble because they judge God before the time. Israel got upset because God didn't free them from Pharaoh the first time Moses went in. Moses got upset about it too. And so they thought God wasn't being faithful to his promise, but they were judging him before the time. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. When it comes to ministries, be careful you don't judge before the time. Because you don't know how it's going to end up. I look at Adoniram Judson, this is all extra by the way, Adoniram Judson, my favorite missionary story, he went to Burma. He was there for seven years before he had his first convert. As a matter of fact, by the time two years later he had a church of about 14 that were attending, he had been there nine years. War broke out between Britain and Burma, and uh, as a result, since they didn't know the difference in Burma between an English man and an American, they threw him in jail. When he got out of jail two years later and his wife had to go around begging for a food to be able to feed her husband in prison. And when he got out of the jail, he could only find two of the members he had. So by that time he'd been there 11 years, he's got two converts. A couple of children that died in childbirth and he wasn't out but just a month or two and his wife died. And then a few months later, the one daughter he had died. Now... Sounds like a failure, but Adoniram Judson was not a failure. You don't judge things before the time. Anyway, that was just extra. Caught my attention again this time. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one, another, for, uh, for one against another. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I beg you tonight, Lord, for clarity of thought and clarity of speech. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, teach us some valuable lessons, so that, Lord, we would be the type of church that brings honor and glory to the God of heaven that walks according to your word and that our judgment be according to your judgment, not just our own prejudices. So, Lord, do a work in our hearts, we pray, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's uh, go over what we have learned so far. The author of the book of 1 Corinthians is who? Paul. And written about what year? A.D. Very good. Written from where? And written to who? The church, very good. And the theme of the book is what? Unity. And the key verse is found in chapter 1 and verse what? Let's all tur turn to it. We're going to read it out loud together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I look at that verse. This is one of those absolutely amazing verses. Could you imagine any church being like what the Holy Spirit of God says he wanted at Corinth? Look at it again. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. 
and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, and I get this, in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, I'm not going to say no church has ever reached that, for surely some have, but it's got to be something that they can only do for a little while. Because there's something about that flesh that we've all got on us that keeps us from that. Now, that's an amazing verse to me. To me, it's one of, one of those amazing verses like John chapter 14 and verse 12. I read that verse, and I'm not going to tell you I understand the depth of the verse, not even close to it. I believe it. I believe everything that the Bible says. I'm just simply saying I don't comprehend fully what he's getting across here. For he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Who's he talking about? Those that believe on him. That we would do greater works than what he did. Now you've got to admit, that's amazing. That's an amazing thought. I don't know anybody that would claim to have done greater works than he did. And yet it's got to be true, Jesus said it. Isn't that right? It's got to be true. So if we're not doing greater works than what he did, the problem is definitely not with him. It's with us. I don't try to explain this away so that we look better. I'm just simply saying this is one of those verses. It's kind of like everlasting life. I have trouble comprehending that. Man, I'm 71 years old. I have trouble comprehending 71 years. I mean, let's face it. The first few years I was on this earth, I was kind of out of it. I don't remember much of that. Miss Beth thought that was funny. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. But imagine, you know, 10,000 years as the songwriter wrote, and we've only just begun. Now, I know that's a long time, and I know that's an amazing amount, but I'm not going to tell you I comprehend that. I just believe it because God says it in his word, and that's enough for me. Amen. Amen. Well, as he writes this letter to the church at Corinth, it was a church that had a number of problems. The outline that we've been going by so far is, first of all, the first nine verses are the what? The introduction. And then you get in verse 10 of chapter 1, on through chapter 4, and he deals with the first major problem, and that was the problem of what? Division. Division. This is not the first church to be divided somewhat. And, by the way, it definitely wasn't the last church to be divided somewhat, and churches still are divided in numbers of ways and still think that somehow they're spiritual when he says of them, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men. So he's dealing with their division. And he labels it in chapter 3 as carnality after reminding them that their total allegiance is to be to Jesus Christ, the one who saved them, the one who won them, the men uh, that the men that used by God are simply the servants of Christ, but our loyalty is to him first of all. You remember in chapter 1, he reminded them that the object of their faith was Christ and that the basis of their faith was Christ. The person that they identified with in baptism was Christ. The gospel that they preached was Christ's gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul didn't say, I'm the power of God unto salvation. He said, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And power in preaching was not men, but Jesus Christ. And, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, he was clear that all that was done was done by the simple message of God and the power of God. I... I decided not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Simple message. He didn't try to get cute with it. He preached it straight. The church at Corinth got started that way. And then in chapter 3, he made it plain that it's not about men, but the church of Jesus Christ is for his glory. Yes, Apollos was a servant. Paul was a servant. Cephas was a servant. And here these men thought that they were more spiritual than the others in the church because they had their favorite preacher, which they knew was better than the others, and shame on them, that was carnality. After saying all that, Paul gets down to what makes a man of God worthy of fellowship. And I think personally, this is one of those passages that every preacher boy, whether they're 
a young boy or a man or whatever, but everyone called to the ministry ought to get down the truth of chapter 4. Because if you don't, you're headed for a shipwreck that's going to be embarrassing and very, very costly. In this, Paul demonstrates his authority and the way that those in God's plan act if they are right with him. First of all, judging God's men, everybody. Everybody judges everybody. I mean, hey, I guarantee you that everyone here has judged some of these politicians this week. Isn't that right? You've seen some of these jokers on the TV and you've said, Liar! Hoping that somehow if you yelled it loud enough that it would get through that, those wires and into their ears where they'd hear it, but they don't and they keep right on doing whatever they're going to do. I'm just talking about politicians. I didn't mention parties, anything like that, but it gets rather dis- We've judged them. By the way, we judge preachers. We judge everybody. We know whether or not they're really worthy to even be a preacher or what else about that. But now, first of all, he says you've got to look at them right. You count them as ministers, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, we know that each one of the three that are mentioned in chapter 3 were different. Paul was slow of speech. Paul had an eye problem, evidently, according to the book of Galatians, and he was slower in speech. But Apollos was an orator, and Peter was simply Peter. I mean, after all, look at there, the first one that's always mentioned in all the list of the apostles in the Scripture. He's special. He says, no, you count us as ministers of Christ and stewards. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, properly then, as ministers, that's not owners, but as ministers of Christ, those who are uh, foremen under the boss, his servants, glory goes to the boss. Amen. All glory is to go to Jesus. Amen. I just, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I get around preachers and they talk about all the things that they've done and I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if Jesus did anything. Really? Really? Why are you taking credit for it? Truth is, the same Jesus that had great crowds and did many miracles, some places didn't have any crowds and didn't do many miracles. Same Jesus both times. The fact that you might have what some would call a little bit of success, have a Sunday school class that's really going great guns, well, that's here, but you go someplace else, you may not have that. If God's going to bless it, then fine, but you better make sure he gets the glory. The stewards, a responsible position, stewards of the... That means they're going to have to answer to the boss, the stewards. And they're not the boss or the hidden things of God. Not to think of them too highly and not to think of them too lowly because they are stewards of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, the scripture says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now that's a term that's used in the book of uh, Hebrews. I'm sorry, Paul makes the same point in chapter 9 and verse 9. I like it that he compares us ministers as oxen. If we could only be that smart. And if we were only that hardworking. I think he probably gives us a rather fancy title there, oxen. So you can read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now that's when he's dealing with eating meat offered and sacrificed to idols. And we'll cover that when we get to it. Notice their requirement, verse 2. Moreover, is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You know, every pastor better make sure that he's found faithful. Didn't say successful. Said faithful. Let God determine the success, but be faithful. We are judged, said Channing, not by the degree of our light, but by fidelity to the light that we have. And there's a lot that goes along with that. There was a poor woman who had a supply of coal laid at her door by a charitable neighbor. A very little girl came out. She had a little small fire shovel, began to take up a shovel full at a time and carry it over to a sort of bin in the cellar. And there was a person who saw what was being done, said to the child, do you really expect to get all that coal in with that little shovel? She was confused by his question, but her answer was very striking. She said, yes, sir, if I work long enough. You can get a lot done if you just work long enough. 
Problem is, you know, I told you I don't like laying bricks. I would go nuts if I had to be a bricklayer. I mean, you work for days and days, and you got four or five rows, and that's all you got. You don't have a building. You don't have anything. Man, it would drive me absolutely crazy. Now, but yet there's a sense in which I'm a bricklayer too. Putting bricks up in the lives of people, and sometimes it takes a long time for anything worthwhile to show. William Carey was known as the father of modern missions. He was a shoe cobbler, preacher, who got a burden after reading Cook's Travels. He got a burden for the millions of people living in India without knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He began to preach about it at preacher's meetings. And for that, there were actually preachers that would stand up and say, Mr. Carey, sit down. I have you know, if God wants to win the heathen, he can do it very well without your help. So that's what he had to face. Finally, there were a couple of other preachers that got the burden. They got together and decided that they would pull some money together to send a missionary. Problem was, they had no one to go. So Carrie said, I'll go. So Carrie left his wife and most of his children, all but his oldest son. He left them in England while he and his oldest boy went to India. Now, Carrie did a tremendous job at translating the Bible into different dialects in the Indian language. He would sit down with his translator five or six days a week, and for hours they would go verse by verse, word by word, and would put those things down. In one dialect, he had spent five years with his translator. Five years, five or six days a week, several hours a day. They finally got it done. They had it in the room where they translated at that night while he was sleeping. That little building caught fire and he lost all of it. So the next day, he and his translator got together and they started all over again. You say, wouldn't that be discouraged? Well, yeah, but those people still needed the gospel in their language. They still needed the Bible. When they asked William Carey, what would you like to have put on your gravestone? His answer was this, he can plod. Plod. Just keep at it. Just keep at it. Turn over to Isaiah a moment. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. This is an amazing passage of scripture to me. Isaiah 28, because this is a passage I think every preacher needs to know in his responsibilities. You know, we get a church and we think, boy, they've got something now in me. I'm going to lead this church on and when it doesn't go, well, I guess God's done with me here. But they've forgotten God doesn't expect a preacher to get a church where it's supposed to be in one message or even two messages or three and not even in one year for the most part. And by the way, I think you'll find that when he gets it to where it's supposed to be, that it, they could go a whole lot higher and those, so they have to continue to work. But I want you to notice what the command is here. He said for precept, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line. Line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. So what's the preacher's job? Precept upon precept, line upon line. Wow. Really? Yeah. Here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept. Now notice what he says in the next verse. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing then underline, yet they would not hear. The preacher's job is to faithfully, continuously give the word, give the word, give the word, give the word. For those who hearken to the word of God, there is a rest to that. But what about those who would not hear? He says in verse 13, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. You say, now wait a second, preacher, that's what he gave them, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Should we be surprised that they got it line upon line and line upon line and precept upon, no, here's the thing. You give them the word of God, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and it will be a rest to their soul if they receive it. But if they don't receive it, it'll be the most boring thing in the world. It will defeat them if they don't receive it. You see, we're not, we're not in this to wow people with our great oratory or anything like that. 
Our responsibility is simply to give them the word and to give it to them straight. And it takes a while to get through it. I'll never forget, there was a Southern Baptist pastor in Chattanooga, Tennessee that had a broadcast on WMOC. I was a disc jockey there working myself through uh, Bible College at Tennessee Temple. And uh, he would come in, and he always amazed me, this, this preacher, because he'd come in, he'd sit down with his Bible, didn't have one note anywhere, and he would preach on a passage for 30 minutes on the radio, and I mean it was good, it was solid, it was wonderful to hear, and uh, then he'd be done. Well, he ended up getting called out of there to go to another church in another city. He was pastoring Woodland Park Baptist Church at the time. And he told me about it. He said there was this uh, pulpit committee that came in. And he said they wanted to ask me some questions. They sat through through the Sunday morning service and the Sunday evening service. And then they met with me and asked me some questions. And he said, when I went there 10 years before, I started in Genesis chapter 1 on Sunday morning. And I ended wherever I got done that morning. And I picked up where I left off that evening. I'd been there 10 years. I was preaching that Sunday morning in Matthew chapter 5. Now, the lady on the pulpit committee, she said, how do you explain that you started in Genesis chapter 1 and you preached until you got done and then you picked up there and preached and after 10 years, you're only in Matthew chapter 5. And he looked at her and said, ma'am, I skipped a lot of it. Line upon line, Line upon line. And he was a very good preacher. But now who's their judge? Who is the judge? Notice in verse 3. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Now, yeah, I'm concerned about what people think of me, but I'm most concerned about what the Lord thinks of me. I mean, there are some things that I preach, and the only reason I preach them is because I know I'm going to have to give an account for whether or not I preached them. When I stand before them, i got news for you. I don't care for people frowning at me. But I've gotten to the place, you start frowning at me, I just park there for a while longer till you smile. So if you're thinking, why doesn't he get off that? Then start smiling at me, and maybe I'll move on. You might be the reason I'm still where I was just at. All right, I figure we need it then. But I've got to answer to God for what I bring to the people that I pastor. I'm going to give an account to Him. So really, whether anybody else likes it or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is I'm going to stand before Jesus and give an account for what I've preached. So then he goes on, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Now here he is talking about judging. And he's talking about judging his stewardship, not known sin. Obviously, some preachers in adultery, stand has to be taken about that. Amen? If he's stealing from the offering, stand has to be taken about that. Whatever. It's one thing to judge known sin... But it's amazing, we get negative on somebody and we start judging, well, he preaches too loud. Well, he preaches too short. I don't know if anybody's ever said that. Uh, He preaches too long. Well, I'll tell you, he spends more time on verses that I don't think are that important. Amazing some of the different judgments that you hear from time to time. But our judging is always biased. But God judges, judges the hidden things. You know, he knows where my heart's at right now while I'm preaching. He knows why I'm saying the things that I'm saying. And if that's not acceptable to him, I'm the one that's going to have to pay for it. But how can we judge? For instance, how do we judge or compare? How do we judge the works of Tom Palmer with Lee Robertson? Lee Robertson is the one who took Highland Park Baptist Church and Drew it to, at one time, the largest church in the world with over 50,000 members. Started Tennessee Temple Schools, all of that. How do we judge Tom Palmer, a missionary helps ministry who's helped, I don't know, hundreds of missionaries with different things, put people up out there and put up with a lot of people? I got news for you. Independent Baptist missionaries aren't always the funnest people to be around. Now, sometimes they may be, but they can be very frustrating too, just like fundamental Baptist pastors. 
They can, but how do you compare those two? I mean, after all, God didn't call Tom to pastor a church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He called him to do that ministry out there. And he's been faithful through these years. He has been faithful in all that he has done. That's how God judges. He doesn't compare Lee Robertson with Tom Palmer. Uh, how about William Carey compared to Chris Lanier? Oh, William Carey is a great man. You don't know him. You never knew him. You've just read what somebody said about him. You don't know him. Chris Lanier, you at least know something about. Yeah, but he's short of stature. Maybe, but he's been faithful. A lot of people are short. Big deal. I don't know. Maybe William Carey was short. How do you compare the ministries of Tony Stark with Glenn Weeks? Well, we don't compare. Because whatever field God put each of them in, they have one job, and that is to be faithful to the calling of God. And that's to be faithful to the end. Because we answer to God. We don't answer the people. Well, I don't think you ought to go there. Don't think you ought to do this. Well, I appreciate that, but this is what I believe the Lord would have me to do. Now, the truth is, Brother Tony pastored this church for the first five and a half years, Madison Baptist Church. My first Sunday here was the sixth anniversary of Madison Baptist Church. And so I've been here, it'll be 31 years uh, next month. I will have been here 31 years if the Lord lets us continue on. If the rapture doesn't take place and so on, uh, that'll be great. Now, the truth is, whereas uh, down the line, theologically, man, we're right on target, standards, holiness, preaching of the Word of God, zeal for souls, all of that. Praise the Lord for it. But we both, we did some things different. Now, you say, well, was he wrong? Not for his, he was the one who started the church. And I didn't start the church. There are some things you do when you start a church that you don't do when you're not starting the church. You understand that? My job is not to overdo or outdo or undo. Brother Stark, my job was to be faithful at when God put me in here. I mean, God took him then from here, and he sent him over to Uganda, did a work I don't think I ever could have done. An amazing work it is. But see, we like to compare people. And he tells these carnal people, man, you're looking at it all wrong. They're both stewards. They answer to a higher judge. And you need to pay attention to that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14 and verse, verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. He shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. All right, we have a bus ministry. I know some good churches don't have a bus ministry. Does that mean they're not right with God because they don't have a bus ministry? God didn't lead them to have a bus ministry. If God didn't want them to have a bus ministry, they'd have been wrong to have a bus ministry. You understand what I'm saying? Their place is different than our place. Our church is different than their church. I know a good church up in Erie, Pennsylvania right now. They have got an amazing ministry going on in Mongolia. I mean, they've got a regular half-hour TV broadcast. I think it was a half-hour last I knew. TV broadcast in the capital city of Mongolia. It's phenomenal. And they've given a lot toward that. They've done a tremendous job. Well, I think y'all spend more time on people at home. Well, those that God leads for that, yes, fine. But God gave them a special ministry that I don't know of any other church that has. So why would we find fault with that? They're to be faithful at it. That's their job. They're stewards. All right. Considering judging ourselves, one pastor said, I learned about the effectiveness of my ministry by watching people in the parking lot rather than in the pews. And there's a lot to that. The idea is when they leave the building, that's when it counts. I heard another preacher say, I don't care how loud you shout or how high you jump, I want to see how you walk when you hit the ground because that's what matters. It ought to make a difference. So first, he deals with judging God's men. And then he deals with authority in the church. Notice, first of all, verses 6 and 7. He talks about the figure. He says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up 
for one another, for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Now, here's the thing. He's basically saying, I'm not going to bring out the heads of the different factions. Because definitely Apollos wasn't the head of one, and Paul wasn't the head of one, and Peter wasn't the head of one. There were people in the church, and I don't have any doubt Paul knew who they were. But he's using the terms Apollos and Paul to make a point that he wanted these carnal Christians to get. They were causing division be, with a lack of spirituality. No one should be puffed up against another. At Corinth, those who thought that they received some special authority gloried instead. They should have gloried instead of becoming a servant. Because that's what we're about, is serving. You get the idea that he will complete this thought later on in detail when we get to chapter 12. He's going to cover that when he likens the church to a body. We'll deal with that at that time. But God gives us all different abilities to be used in service. It'd be silly to try to compare a whale and a cactus when a whale couldn't make it in the desert. Cactus isn't going to make it in the ocean. Two different parts of God's creations, two totally different jobs to do. We have special gifts. We use them how, uh, when we use them and how determines whether we actually complete the will of God, what he wants for our lives. I try to warn the preacher boy sometimes. Now, this is what I believe I would do, but you're, you're going to have to do what the Lord leads you to do. Amen. I can't tell you the will of God for everything in your life unless there's a thus saith the Lord that goes with it. If there's a thus saith the Lord, then we go ahead. But uh, then he contrasts between carnal and spiritual leaders in verses 8 through 13. He says, Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us apostles last. Now remember, what did he just call them in chapter 3? Carnal. Here he says, now ye are full, ye are rich, ye have reigned. As kings without us. He says, I think God has set forth us apostles last. Wait a second. Ephesians chapter 4, apostles come first. And he gave some to the church. First apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, then pastors and teachers. Now here he says, apostles last. What's he doing? I believe, I believe he's being sarcastic. Because these were not a spiritual people, they were a carnal people. And yet they had set, them out, set themselves up to judge God's men. Here they are sitting around doing nothing but judging those that are trying to fulfill the call of God. Like somehow they've got power. Wait, you say, really? Do you think, me? well, all right, let's go on. Go to um, verse 9. For I think that God has set forth us apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Ye, you carnal Christians, ye are wise in Christ. We, Paul puts himself in this, are weak. He says, but ye, you carnal Christians, are strong. Ye are honorable. But we are despised. You see that had lift, they, how they had lifted themselves up? Yeah, let me hit you with something here. Let, let me hit you with a thought. I want you to meditate upon it. Do you realize that there are some people that don't agree with us on some things, but they love God as much as we do? Do you understand that? Now, I'm not going to run my Christian life by how they're running theirs. By the same token, I realize there are some good people, godly people, who love the Lord, who don't have the dress standards we have. There are even some godly people who really do love the Lord, who don't have the music standards we have. You see, what we want to do, we want to make everybody that's different the enemy. Well, that's easy to do politically, isn't it? And if we're not careful, we do that spiritually speaking as well. Oh, well, they, they, don't, they don't dot their I's and cross their T's exactly like we do. 
Uh, and man, they've got to be carnal. They've got to be worldly. They've got to be backslidden on God. I want you to get a hold of this thought. I've tried to give it to our preacher boys over and over again. That God will bless a right heart under a wrong head a lot more than he'll bless a wrong heart under a right head. Did I say that right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Whew. I'm worried about that. In the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. You know, I can't guarantee I've got a right head. I mean, I want to have a right head. I, 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 want to, I, I want to look at the scripture exactly like God would have me look at the scripture. I'd like to be right about every doctrinal thing that I believe. And if I find out I'm wrong about something, well, I'll change it and believe that, then I can be right again. But do you know what? If I don't have a right heart, that's not going to please God. He wants a right heart. I can't guarantee I've got a right head, but I can make sure I have a right heart. That's keeping close accounts with God. He resists the proud, but he giveth grace to who? The humble. You see, as humans, this is not a fundamental failing. It's that way in every group. You understand this? I see some of these guys write about problems with fundamentalists. And the thing is, the things they mention, they've got the same problems in their groups. And the same problems <laughs> with, with their groups is because it's a human thing. We want to make enemies of those who are different. We don't like different. Humans don't like different. We can't stand different. As a matter of fact, when I was out in Navajo land many years ago at the Corleys, and um, I was shocked when Brother Ron Corley said to me, he said, uh, he said, you know, of course, the Apache reservation is kind of a patchwork out there and right next to the Navajo reservation. And from what he told me now, and I only have his word to go on, I don't believe he was lying to me, they hate one another. I said, hate one another? How can they hate one another? They're Indians. He said, no, they hate one another. I said, you mean they can tell one another apart just by looking at them? Absolutely. I asked him, I said, can you tell them apart by looking at them? Can you tell? If we drove down the road, I said, what is that? He, he could tell. He said, yeah, I can tell you. I said, well, how? He said, I can't exactly tell you how. I've just been out here long enough. I can tell the difference. Hate one another. You remember the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda? They were all Rondis. They killed a million of each other, the Hutus and the Tutsis. They were not even two different tribes. Do you know the main difference between the Tutsis, who were the Watutsis, the Tutsis and the Hutus? The main difference was, and I hope I get this right, the Hutus were the agrarian part of the society. They were the ones that did the farming. And the Tutsis were the livestock group. And I remember when we were over there, one of the, one of the preachers in uh, Uganda there told us that there was a, a, a Tutsi lady that was working in an office and a Hutu man came in. He said, you know, if we were just a few miles across the border, I'd be killing you. They weren't two different tribes. They were two different factions of the same tribe. And they could tell the difference in how they looked. How? What did they hate? Difference. Race problem around the world has nothing to do with the color of the skin. It has to do with different. We don't like different. You go among Asian people, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. You say, let's see now, which one are the Japanese and which one are the Chinese? Eyes go which way? I don't know. Do you know? You know? Okay. I don't know. And as Americans, we look at them and say, well, they're all Asian. Well, no, they're not. Not to them. Why do they hate one another? Different. Do you understand? That's the problem. And sometimes we do that in our religious world. We hate people because they're different. Oh, well, we never use such a strong word as hate. But we are totally disgusted with them because they're different. But what if they're truly... now? I'm not talking about those who preach a false gospel. That's a whole different matter. Those that preach another gospel, that's different. Those are people sending folks to hell. 
And whereas I may not agree with some of the brethren on a number of things, they don't have to answer to me when they stand before God. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. That's right. We need to understand that. And we got more important things to do Amen. than worry about whether or not this guy's, you know, hey, send me a million dollars and I'll put your name on a brick that goes into our college wall. All right. I wouldn't do it, but then that's not the ministry God's put me to, so I'm not going to worry about it. God will take care of them, just like he'll take care of me. Better make sure that I'm right. We get, maybe it's an American thing. We just want to police the world. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, it says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The more of a leader a man is, the more of a servant he will be. The more he will be willing to do without. The non-servants are more concerned about doing without than doing the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Then he gives an entreaty here. Notice he says, beginning in verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, wherefore I beseech you be followers of me. Whoa, looky there. He had the same problem. He didn't have internet. He didn't have TV ministries. He, he didn't have any of those things going on. And yet there were people that listened to every different preacher they'd listened to, and they pick and chose what they wanted to believe and what they wanted. He says, you people, you got 10,000 instructors, but you only got one father. He said, I'm the one that won you people to Christ. I'm the one that's invested in you. Yeah, go ahead. You know, you, you make sure that those ministries, that some of these guys have their, have their $54 million jets and go ahead and send them money, you know, while, while the church at home is, is not able to do things it ought to be doing in its community. But I'll tell you what, when you go to the hospital, call them up and see how many times they'll call you back and pray for you. I mean, when COVID-19 is over. Whether or not they're concerned, whether or not you lost a brother or sister or whatever, man, they don't care. But it's amazing. I think sometimes we try to surround ourselves with so many different really great ministries so we can pick and choose. And that's the kind of Christian we are. And that's so sad because it's getting things all wrong. So his entreaty to them was, uh, hey, I'm not writing this to shame you. He says, wherefore I beseech you. Verse 16 is interesting. Be followers of me. What would happen if pastor got up on Sunday and said, hey, folks, follow me. Follow me. I'm not a man follower. Paul said, follow me. Chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, follow me even as I also follow Christ. Philippians chapter 3, again, he says, be ye followers of me. He's the one that won these people to Christ. He's concerned about them. But now he does put that caveat on there, follow me even as I also follow Christ. Doesn't say it here in this particular passage, but he will in chapter 11 and verse 1. Follow me. So how do I know if the preacher is following Christ? You got the book right there. Just shine the light of the word of God on him when he gets off the path. Then you just keep following Christ anyway. Don't you go with him when he goes after the world. Don't do that. So Paul then says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere and in every church. Now, Paul is telling them, I'm sending Timothy. Timothy's the one that's going to carry this letter to the Corinthians. He said, I'm sending Timothy to make sure you get this. He said, now I want you to get it. Now, his last part of this chapter and the last part of this section on division, he's basically saying this, how I act when I get there. After Timothy's been there and he tells me how you've received this letter, how I act will be determined by how you took the message. Notice what he says. He says, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. 
For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye then? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? He's telling them, this is up to you. What you get. I like coming to people in love, but there are just times you got to have the rod. I enjoyed loving, loving my kids, man. I just I love them when they jump up in my lap and put their arms around my neck. But there were some time I was the last, there were some times I was the last person they wanted to see. Because they knew what was coming. Chastening and discipline. Sometimes as a pastor, you've got to say the hard things, and I don't care what it is, there's going to be people in the church going to disagree with you on it. Now say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, aren't you glad you're not the pastor and don't have to worry about it? I have to do it and then, of course, face the Lord with what I've done. So he, was, he says he's perfectly willing to be tough if necessary. He said, he's saying, basically, I'll give what's needed. Very few of God's men are received as God's men when their message is one of rebuke. That's not popular. They don't like it. For instance, we're against rock music. We'll not have it. You can disagree all you want. By the way, about stuff like that, let me ask you this question. Uh, is it a sin not to listen to rock music? Is it a sin not to listen to rock music? It's not. Isn't that right? All right. Now, I've got a lot of reasons why I believe listening to rock music is a sin. Now, you may say, well, no, I don't see any problem with it. Yeah, they may cuss and they may curse God and they may talk about immorality and drug use and rebellion and fighting the cops and all that. They may talk about it. I don't see anything wrong with it. All right, but you admit there's nothing wrong. There's no sin in not listening to it. Then why not just stay away from sin and not listen to it? Doesn't that just make sense? You know, that would take care of a lot of your TV viewing if you say, would it be a sin not to watch this show? Is it possible there's going to be stuff in here that's things God wouldn't want me to see? Then why not just not watch it then? Amen. Instead of having to feel bad about it later on. You see, if, if people just give it some thought, but the truth is we want as much of the world that we can stand and still consider ourselves Christians. And that's the wrong way to look at it. He that doubteth is damned of eat because he of not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin... Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, the standard is this. If you're not 100% sure that it's right, then you don't do it. Period. Now here's Paul. This church is divided. They've got their favorite preachers, got some different methods about them. That's all right. But everyone that was mentioned there was still true to the Lord. So they're just, I don't like Paul. He's slow of speech. I, I, I like to hear Paul. Oh, you know, Peter, he sticks his foot in his mouth and... and Shut up, they're God's men, they're going to answer to God for it. Whatever they do, I want to be faithful to the end. Just be faithful. Now, I thank God that how I'm judged at the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be by vote. That's good news, man. It's not going to be by debate. People aren't going to say... Jesus isn't going to say to everybody that I've had the privilege of pastoring, not going to say, how many think I ought to give them something? Anybody here got something bad to say about Brother Allison? I think one of the things that shocked me the most, they never told me this in Bible college, there are things they never prepared me for. But I never would have thought that in pastoring Christians that there would be so many people after 45 years who absolutely hate my guts. I don't mean they're ambivalent toward me. I mean they hate me. They never told me that would happen. But you know, people hated Paul. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians chapter 4. Wow. I guess if I'd have read my Bible closer, I'd have picked it up on my own. And maybe the Bible college figured I would pick it up if I read it. Instead of, well, people don't like me. And, you know, it's kind of like the mom who said to her son, said, son, why, why aren't you dressed for church today? Oh, nobody will talk to me. Nobody likes me. They gossip about me. He said, but son, you're the pastor. You got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 
So it's our job, be faithful to the end. Just be faithful right to the end. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, take these words and deal with our hearts. May we not fall into the Corinthian problem of division. Please help us, Lord, to get it, I pray in Jesus' name.